for scholarship and research here at Hofstra University, and I'm also a professor in the Department of Geology, Environment, and Sustainability, and I want to thank you for coming to tonight's Science Night live lecture. I just have one quick announcement to make before we get started and I introduce the tonight's speaker. In, on November uh, 16th, Wednesday, November 16th, we have another speaker coming up as part of our Science Night live lecture the last one of this semester, Dr. Karine Kiriakou, uh, who is a professor in public health here at Hofstra, will be speaking on extending the human lifespan and implications of an aging population, which should be rather interesting. Seven o'clock here in this same room on November 16th. Well, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Jessica St. Angelo, who is an assistant professor of biology here at Hofstra University. Jessica uh, received her BS in, in zoology from Auburn University and right away started graduate school in Cornell, where she started to her, her long career of working on uh, issues of coral reefs. Four days after graduation, she was back in the field scuba diving in Mexico, and she spent the next five and a half years doing research on coral reefs all over the world, particularly in the Caribbean. She's very interested in coral disease and diversity, and also on the issue of increasing ocean temperatures on coral diseases. As we've seen in news reports, the high temperatures we're seeing in the oceans and the seas can stress coral, making them more likely to get sick, while at the same time increasing the growth of pathogens. After that venture, she went on to University of California, San Diego Scripps Institution, Institute of Oceanography for a postdoc where she continued her work on microbes and corals and coral disease and health, but there she had an epiphany and started her true passion, which was the study of public education and outreach in the sciences. And she started to work for the U.S. Forest Service in the Red River Gorge of Kentucky and spent several years as the director of their education center, working on a variety of different issues, helping visitors, helping fight wildfires, conducting media interviews, and also getting trained in search and rescue. So we're in good hands tonight with Dr. St. Angelo. She came back to academia to focus in on, on educational research, and she's very interested in how we could best support student learning in the sciences to retain and recruit diverse groups of future scientists. I would like you to Join me in welcoming Jessica St. Angelo to the stage where she'll be giving us a lecture tonight on Caught Between a Rock and a Hot Place, Coral Reefs and Climate Change. Hi, everyone. So uh, as Bob mentioned, I've had a relatively nonlinear career path. Uh, I was straight out of undergrad. I started my work for my PhD. Uh, four days after I graduated, I was diving in Mexico. And for the next about eight years, I was paid to travel the world in scuba dives. It was really pretty cool. Uh, this is the kind of place where I would get to work. This is act actually in Micronesia. Um, and you can see it's beautiful. Uh, the waters are crystal clear. They're really warm. And you have these amazing corals that are present. You guys know what these fish are, yes? Who is this? This is Nemo, right? A clownfish. And they're hanging out in their anemone. So the corals I'm going to talk to you about are in the same group of organisms as anemones. And you just may be more familiar with anemones because if you've been diving on a reef, the anemone structure is a bit larger. 
And uh, has anyone been scuba diving or snorkeling? Oh, oh, good, lots of fellow divers, okay. Uh, how about, um, has anyone touched a sea anemone? Maybe at a touch tank, at an uh, aquarium, right? Uh, when you touched it, what it, it, it feels kind of sticky when you pull your finger away. And that's because they have these little harpoons that when you touch them, those harpoons stick in your finger and as you pull away, you're basically pulling those off of the anemone. Now, the anemones they put in the touch tanks won't really hurt you. That's the idea, right? You don't want to put a touch tank out and have people getting stung. The sea anemones and the corals have those same types of cells, which is what helps group them together. So here's another picture of an anemone. And you can see we have the tentacles here, and then the space in the middle where we're lacking some tentacles, that's where the mouth is. What they'll do is they'll reach out with their tentacles and they'll grab food from the water column and stuff it into their mouth, okay? The same sorts of things happen with corals. I want to show you this anemone because it's curled up in on itself. So it's pulled its tentacles in, and this can happen if they feel threatened for some reason. They can pull in like that. Turns out corals can do the same thing. Take a look at these guys. Looks like a whole bunch of little sea anemones reaching out of the screen at you. These are coral polyps. So they have this colonial, which means you have lots of little individual polyps that are all genetically identical and they're all attached to each other, functioning as one large colony. Now these guys are extended, but you can see here that they can also tuck in just like that larger anemone can. So a lot of similarities here. This is a large monostriated coral, uh, a hard coral in the Caribbean. And so you can actually see the little dots on it. So those are all the little polyps which right now are tucked in. And again, here's our close up of them. If we were to look at a schematic of them, they look like this, kind of like a little tiny sea anemone sitting in a little cup. And what's cool about these polyps is that they are secreting their own skeleton underneath of them. So that's what you can see, it's the darkened area here. This is a little calcium carbonate or a limestone skeleton that this little polyp is secreting for itself. Here is what a polyp actually looks like when it's extended. And you'll notice that most of the tissue is really clear. Okay, that's gonna be important for us later. But you'll see some little brown spots in there. Those brown spots are algae, right? So algae that look like this, they're called zooxanthellae. These zooxanthellae use the sun's energy, the sun's light, to create food, like sugars and things, that it gives to the coral animal. And what's really neat about these zooxanthellae is they're actually inside of the coral animal cells. Okay, so they're a very tight relationship, we call it a symbiosis, where the coral is getting food and resources from the zooxanthellae, uh, and then the zooxanthellae have a nice safe place to live, uh, they're receiving some carbon dioxide, they're receiving some nitrogenous waste from the coral, so it's a really tight relationship. And in this image, you can actually see the zooxanthellae. This is a, a, a histological slide where we took a coral, we preserved it, and we cut it in very thin slices so we could look at individual cells. And what you can see is the little brown dots here, these are the zooxanthellae, and they're actually inside of this coral cells. These zooxanthellae are incredibly important for the coral because the vast majority of the food that the coral gets is from these zooxanthellae, from these algae. That's one of the reasons why you have to go to, like, to the Caribbean, where it's beautiful and the, the water is very clear, because we need to have that sunlight coming down, hitting these algae and providing the main amount of nutrients that these corals need so the corals can survive. Now, this is what the skeleton looks like. So this is with all the tissue removed. This is just a coral skeleton. Notice that it looks white, okay? This is, again, important for us for later. And each of these little cups is where one of those little polyps would be sitting. This is what it looks like on the reef. So this is uh, in the Caribbean where I did a lot of my work. And there are a couple different types of corals here. You can see the big branching ones. Those are the elkhorn corals. They clearly provide a lot of 3D structure to the reef. And then you have other types of corals, which are my personal favorites, the gorgonian corals, which have a softer skeleton. And they actually can wave in the oceans. They kind of look plant-like. They're, they're growing up a bit more. Here's a sea fan coral. This is what I primarily worked on. Here's another type of coral that looks like little fingers that are sticking up and they wave around. You'll notice that on these elkhorn coral, they look kind of brown and a little fuzzy. Those are all of the little polyps, hundreds of thousands or millions of these little polyps that are sticking up, right, these little animals. Even the sea fan is kind of brown in the middle where you have the, the polyps sticking out. 
So these polyps are really important because yes, they're pulling in some food from the ocean, but primarily they're housing these algae. What do coral reefs provide to us? Well, for example, you've probably heard of the Great Barrier Reef, the largest reef that we have uh, up here on the northeast part of Australia. It's about the size of 70 million football fields. Uh, it's about as long as uh, if you were to drive from New York and you got halfway to LA, that's about how long it is from north to south. It's really big. And there's all kinds of things there. There are 3,000 reefs, 600 islands, over 1,600 species of fish, over 100 species of sharks and rays, and over 600 types of corals. Incredibly diverse area, the greatest diversity of, of coral in particular that we have in the world. Coral reefs not only provide us a place for all these different organisms to live, um, some people consider them to be the rainforest of the ocean because of the amount of diversity that's there, but they're important to us personally. So this woman, for example, um, her life was saved by coral reefs. She was diagnosed with a form of cancer, and the chemotherapy drug they ended up using for her was from a sponge that was found on a coral reef. So protecting this biodiversity is important to us for our own personal health because there are so many different drugs that we can find there and use to help people. Reefs also help us in a very practical way in terms of protecting our towns, our cities, uh, our beaches. So in this figure, we're talking about how coral reefs reduce about 97% of the wave energy of waves that come crashing in. So if there's a storm, I would really rather those waves crash on a reef that's a bit offshore and then be much gentler by the time they get to the coast where maybe my home is or if I own a hotel where my hotel is, right, to protect us. These, they serve as natural barriers that help save us time and money and reduce erosion. It's really important for us, and 63 million people globally rely on reefs in some form to protect those coastal areas where they live. So very important to us for a lot of different reasons. So where are these reefs? Well, the purple dots indicate all the places in the world where we have reefs. Notice that most of them are concentrated kind of in the middle, uh, you know, just north and south of the equator. Again, that's because we need this constant sunlight and this very clear water. So you can see here, visibility is really far. Um, on good days when we would go out diving, you could see 150, 200 feet underwater. <clears throat> there were also bad days when we went out. Uh, one day was so bad that we were going down the anchor line of the boat and I literally hit the bottom of the ocean with my head because uh, it was so murky and horrible and that's when we aborted that dive and went back to shore. Uh, now, the red dots indicate places where I spent a fair amount of time as a graduate student and as a postdoc. So I did a lot of work in the Florida Keys, right down near Key West. I would spend about two months of the year down there. Uh, the east coast of the Mexican Yucatan Peninsula and off the coast of Belize, which was very interesting because I was the only person in my research group who spoke Spanish. So for example, if we were driving through the jungle to get down to a site and we came across the Mexican military, I was the one who had to try to talk to them and hope that we wouldn't get in any sort of trouble. Um, so no pressure, not something I anticipated I would have to do as a graduate student. Uh, did a fair amount of work in Hawaii and then also a small island nation north of Australia called Palau, which was very interesting because um, they have saltwater crocodiles. And so while working there one day, it was a relatively murky day, and there were these really interesting worms that were crawling all over the corals. Partway through the dive, um, I kind of get that sensation of the hairs standing up on the back of my neck. Thought that was a little weird, but I was like, we just need to finish the work. We get back on the boat, and everyone's comparing notes about the dive, and someone else was like, did anyone else have kind of a creepy feeling? And I was like, ooh, me too, we all did. And we're pretty sure that there was a saltwater crocodile that must have been hanging out near us who could see us, who we couldn't see it. So, you know, marine biology is great, it's a lot of fun, uh, but sometimes there are some unanticipated threats that you aren't thinking about when you start that type of career. Uh, so this is Hawaii, uh, so this is where I spent a fair amount of time working, and we're just going to zoom in here on Oahu. What I want to point out to you, right, these are volcanic islands, so there are active volcanoes, and that's what's building up uh, enough uh, land mass to get it up above the water and actually have an island that people can be on. But you end up with these um, areas just underwater that are still shallow enough that you get these reefs forming. So we're going to zoom in here. So here's Oahu. It's a really rough place to have to work, I promise. It's a struggle to go to beautiful, warm places. Um, so this is Kaneohe Bay, which is a really famous bay uh, in terms of marine ecology, in part because you'll notice that there's a lot of homes uh, and development right around here. And originally, there was a lot of sewage that was being dumped in there. So you can imagine that that's going to cause some uh, major impacts 
on the, on the dynamics there when you have all that particularly nitrogen loading. So if we zoom in, this is Coconut Island. Uh, this is where the University of Hawaii has a marine lab. So I'm gonna zoom in a little more. And you can see that um, these shallow areas right around here, full of coral. And sometimes if the tide is low, um, you know, that coral is only under six inches of water. Um, so really, really close to, up to the water. And what you'll also notice, which is interesting, is there's no road to get to Coconut Island. There's no bridge. What you have to do is come down here and park in a little parking lot and like double and triple park people in. And then you leave your car keys, you hang them in this little box so that if someone needs to get their car out, they can move your car and the other person's car and finally get their car out. You just trust people not to steal your car. So what you do is you walk out here on the pier and then you, there's a little phone and you call the guy that's sitting over here and he comes over in a boat and picks you up. So it's a really interesting way to get to work each day. Uh, it's a great place to go snorkeling. Uh, it's not recommended at dawn and dusk because Kaneohe Bay is also a nursery for hammerhead sharks and they tend to be very active around those times of day. So if you go to Coconut Island and you want to do some snorkeling, avoid doing so at, at dawn and dusk, okay? Uh, you guys are probably familiar with Gilligan's Island. Turns out Coconut Island is the island in Gilligan's Island that is used in the introductory credits. So a little piece of trivia for you there. I worked on Gilligan's Island, okay? Uh, this is from Sombrero Key in the Florida Keys where I spent a lot of my time. There are lots of these patch reefs that are off of the Keys and they end up being so shallow, there are actually waves cresting right here, which is why there's a lighthouse. The idea is that you can come out with your boat and ideally you anchor in the sand. So the lighter areas are the sand and the darker areas are the patch reefs. Some of these, some of these uh, patch reefs attract a lot of tourists. So a colleague and I went out to sample, we were on a research vessel, we got dropped off and the plan was that they would drop us off, we would do a drift dive. So we would flow with the current and then the boat would pick us up at the other end. But for whatever reason, my colleague decided once we were underwater and could no longer communicate with the boat, uh, that he was gonna swim up current. So they drop us off, the boat goes this way, we apparently go that way underwater, and when we come up an hour later, we are very far apart from each other. So we're trying to wave to them and get their attention, and uh, unfortunately, we did not attract their attention, rather we attracted the attention of a glass bottom boat with lots of tourists on it who were very interested at these people with these big bags of gear and these, these big meter sticks. Uh, and so they were kind enough to radio to us to get our research vessel, but um, you know, a little bit embarrassing that all these tourists were wondering what these crazy scientists were doing so far from their research vessel. This is Palau. An amazing place. If you ever have an opportunity to go, there are all these amazing uh, limestone islands that you can see are being undercut uh, and eroded by the ocean. Uh, this was another interesting place where we were interested in looking at um, coral diversity, disease, and nutrients. When I went diving there, um, the sewage outfall was right on the reef. So a sewage outfall essentially is a giant pipe with kind of a, a gate on top of it that all the stuff comes out of. And when I went diving there, they only had primary sewage treatment, which means that they removed the solids, but nothing else. So when we pulled up to go diving, and it was a local um, tourist boat operator that was bringing us around, um, it smelled like poop, frankly. Uh, and the dive boat captain was like, Wait, re really? No one ever wants to dive here, but we did our duty, and we went diving there, uh, and it was gorgeous. It was one of the most beautiful reefs I've been on. And what was happening was the nutrients that were coming out of that pipe were not impacting that area right there. They were actually going up and then spreading out on top of the water and then coming back down and impacting other reefs where we were, we were studying. But um, I definitely made sure uh, I got all my vaccinations before I went diving there. That was probably one of the most disgusting places that I, I got to go diving, right, for free. I got to go diving for free, but I got to go diving on a sewage outfall. So I want to remind you about the coral biology, right? We have these algae that are inside the coral the coral animal tissue itself is clear, and remember, it's sitting on top of that white skeleton. The reason the coral has pigment to it, the primary reason, is because of the zooxanthellae, okay? And remember, the skeleton underneath is white. These corals are supposed to be colorful. They are not. That is because we are towards the end of the third global bleaching event in recent history. This is major. What happens when corals bleach is that if the sea surface temperatures, the water temperature gets too high, something in that really special relationship between the algae and the coral animal breaks down. And the algae either leave or are kicked out by the coral, 
When they leave, they take their pigments with them. Remember, those algae are the primary source of nutrition for that coral animal. So without the algae present, the coral animal can starve to death. Now, if the water temperatures come back down soon enough, they can be repopulated. The coral can be repopulated with the algae. But if it stays too hot for too long, the coral will die. Okay? Just to illustrate to you how this really is a global event that's occurring right now, every red dot is a place where we've had reports of bleaching, and this is not a comprehensive map. But it shows you the scale of what is currently happening. So you can see here, um, this is from May of this year in Kiribati, here are the Maldives, here's the Great Barrier Reef, all from earlier this year. A worldwide coral bleaching event. Here's a bleached coral. This was taken by a colleague of mine, Ruth Gates, in Hawaii this past October, almost exactly a year ago. This is in Hawaii. This coral is actually dead. And I can tell that because up here on the tips, it's kind of green and fuzzy. And those are little algae filaments, not the nice zooxanthellae, right, but other types of algae that are looking for space to grow on the reef. One of the limiting factors on a reef is space. So the coral animal and all the other algae and the coral and algae and the, everything else that's trying to make a living there are always fighting for space. As soon as that coral dies and that nice calcium carbonate skeleton is open and available, organisms will come in and start growing on it. Here's another example. So this is live, happy tissue over here of this coral. Then you see this white band. This is a disease front that has been slowly marching its way across this coral. And then over here, you can see there is some schmutzy stuff growing on it. And then you can see more and more, because this was killed longer ago, and this was killed more recently. Diseases like this pick up when the coral animal is stressed, like when sea surface temperatures are warm. Just to give you an example, uh, uh, an image to capture the extent of this. This was in uh, Japan uh, last month, all these bleached corals. Uh, here is Heron Island this past February, tons of bleached corals. Heron Island is on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, here's a really nice sequence, well, not nice, I mean it's a, it's a nice illustration, but it's awful that it's happening, um, of, in American Samoa. So here they did basically a panorama three times at three different points in time, and then they're just kind of overlaying those images for you. Here's our healthy reef in December of 2014. Here it's bleached and dying, and now it's dead, and there's all this algae and crud growing all over the dead corals. This has a huge impact on the reef, on uh, the other animals that would be living there that would normally rely on the corals and now can't. Here's another great example. Uh, this is from Lizard Island, which is also on the Great Barrier Reef of the bleached coral, and at least you do still have some fish around here. And then two months later, that coral is dead, and look at all that spongy algae that's growing all over it. So this has really huge implications. Um, if the coral is dead, it's clearly not growing, right? Um, and it actually is getting broken down. So we're actually losing our reefs as well as losing um, live coral. So Terry Hughes is uh, a, an internationally known and well-respected uh, coral reef biologist. And he has been actively involved in monitoring this bleaching event that's been going on. This image here is from NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration here in the United States. And they have a coral watch program where they keep a close eye on the temperatures of the ocean. Now, if things are in red, that means things are really, high, uh, really hot and we're at alert level two, which means that there's a huge high probability of bleaching. And look at all the red all over the world. So this was in March, which was their summer, uh, towards the end of their summer, getting into their fall. So the Great Barrier Reef is huge, right? So it's halfway from New York to LA. That's how long it is. There's no way we can send enough divers out to all of those reefs to be able to survey all of them. So what Terry and his colleagues did was they used a helicopter. The bleaching is so extensive that you can see what's happening on the reef from this helicopter. Uh, so here they are. Here are some images. So all this white should not be white. Those are bleached corals. Uh, here are some more. They had done 433 reefs by this point, and it's crazy white. It's not supposed to be that way. Uh, and here's another one. They did uh, 3,200 kilometers and 520 reefs in like four days. That's a crazy amount of surveying. And what's really great about what they did was they not only had people up in the helicopters looking around, but they also did send divers out. So they would lay out a transect tape. This basically lets you orient and see where you are and, and measure your distance. And then they sent divers out to record who was bleached, how much was bleached. And it turns out that there's a really nice correlation between what the divers were actually seeing underwater and what they were seeing from the chopper, right? So that we know that 
what they were seeing from the sky was relatively accurate. Why is this happening? You've probably heard of the greenhouse effect. We have our sun, which is sending light and energy down towards the earth. And thank goodness that we have an atmosphere, right? That means that this is a place where we can live. You can think of the atmosphere like a light blanket that you have on that helps to trap some heat. So some heat and some energy is trapped by the atmosphere, and some of it gets reflected back out into space. The issue is that since the Industrial Revolution, we have been pumping lots of stuff into the atmosphere, in particular, like carbon dioxide and methane, and there are other molecules as well. And essentially what's that, what that has done is it's changed that light blanket into like a down comforter, right? So it's retaining a lot more heat in the Earth, and that can have some really major impacts. So you can see this in lots of ways. So what we're seeing here is that 57 degrees Fahrenheit was sort of the historical, like recent global average temperature. If you averaged all the temperatures from the North Pole to the South Pole, all the way from the East to the West, we came up with about 57 on average. And what we're plotting here is the difference from that average in each year. So you can see like in the 70s, we were hopping back and forth above and below that average. That's pretty normal, oscillating around an average or around a mean. But then notice that the trend has been pretty much upwards ever since then. And I've marked three important dates. So 98, 2010, and 2015-16, those are the years when we saw our worldwide global bleaching events. And notice that they tend to happen um, at times where it hasn't been this hot before, right? It hasn't been this hot before. It certainly hasn't been this hot before. When we have these increases in temperatures, when we see these corals getting really stressed. Another way to look at that, each colored line is a year. Uh, notice that these lines are all clustering together, but 2015 was warmer than those, and 2016 has been the warmest year on record ever. And of course, right here we are in New York, right here. We are in the red. That means that we are quite a few degrees above uh, average. This was for this past winter, and I think we've all experienced that, and certainly we've experienced it recently, where it's been like 80 degrees in October, which is crazy. So things have been getting warmer. So I talked about the atmosphere, and I showed you right, North America, which is a continent. But if that's all I talked to you about, we're missing a huge part of the story. Because over 90% of that increase in temperature is actually being absorbed by our oceans. So no wonder our corals are really being impacted. There's a lot of heat going into the oceans. Now, sometimes things recover. So I mentioned that sometimes if the temperature uh, isn't too high for too long, that the corals can survive. In this case, in 1987, these guys bleached, but then they were recovered uh, by a couple years later. That bleaching event didn't last for so long. Here's another coral that here it was originally, it bleached, and then things got better, and it recovered. So it's possible to recover. The problem is that... Um, we're seeing not only more frequent high sea surface temperatures, but it's staying hotter for longer than it has before. In particular, this bleaching event has been one of the longest duration events we've seen. So where do I fit into this? This is me, uh, about 80 feet underwater in Palau, diving on a wall. I'm behind a very dead sea fan coral. Uh, I can tell it's been dead for a while because there's all these other organisms growing on it. Uh, in fact, you're not supposed to notice this, but since we're friends, I'll point it out to you. Uh, I'm actually holding scissors here and a collection bag. Uh, typically, you don't want to have pictures of you out on the reef trying to save the reef when you're actually sampling the reef and taking samples home with you, but we had permits to do it. Uh, and in fact, I'm glad I was hiding the scissors because uh, this picture actually um, was associated with a publication that we had that was international and got a lot of press, and so this picture uh, went around the world. But this is where I usually worked, which was in the Caribbean. So you can see uh, my coral of choice, the sea fan coral. Uh, here we do have a hard coral, but most of them are those Gorgonian corals, the ones that wave around. And this coral in particular is thick. You can see it's got these purple margins, and that was mostly what I was studying, was these six sea fan corals. Uh, everyone's wearing shoes, which is good to see, and you likely have Aspergillus on the bottom of your shoes. Aspergillus is a common soil fungus, and that's what's infecting these sea fan corals. Right? It's very prevalent, um, but for some reason it's making these corals thick. So here I am in the Caribbean, uh, not the most glorious looking site. Uh, and as a marine biologist, I actually spent most of my time looking down, uh, actually looking at the diversity of these corals and seeing who was present, who was absent, who was sick, who was not. So I would spend a lot of time doing this, doing surveys all through the Caribbean. Uh, when you're working with hard corals, sometimes you would even take uh, these quadrats out and put them down. 
and basically visually look and say, well, how many squares are covered by this coral? So maybe there are 10 squares that are covered by this type of coral, five squares this type. So that's the kind of work that you're doing. It gets a little rote after a while and a little mundane, um, but it's important data to collect so we can watch these over time. This is a, a sea fan coral that's sick, so the fungus has infected it here, and you can see the tissue is dying here, and it's also infected it up here, and you have these tumors forming around it. So different corals respond to disease in different ways. The sea fans try to fight off the fungus, but it turns out that when water temperatures get warm, the sea fan gets stressed out, and the fungus grows really fast. So those warming temperatures not only can cause bleaching in corals, but can cause diseases to get worse. Uh, here are some examples. This is Pickles Reef in the Florida Keys, which was one of our scrubby sites. All of these things are dead sea fans. It's like a sea fan graveyard. But then we would have other sites just a few kilometers away that had lots of healthy sea fans, and we still don't understand those dynamics. So if anyone is looking for interesting research projects for a PhD, say, there's a lot of work that can be done where you get to travel to these wonderful places and help us figure out what's going on with these dynamics. We would also do things like monitoring sea fans. So this was apparently a sea fan 917. Uh, and we would go out and photo monitor them and watch them through time to see what was happening. I would do experiments in tanks. So this is a lab that's about 20 miles from Key West. Um, so I would do some experiments in tanks. And then you can see one of my little corals here. All the little brown dots are polyps. They're all pulled in. This one was very mad at me because I was keeping it in warm water and I infected it with the fungus. So it was not a very happy coral when this picture was taken. Uh, here are some colleagues and I working underwater. This is my PhD advisor, Drew Harvell, who uh, is a professor and is doing some really interesting work on a sea star disease. This is Laura Pettish. She was an undergrad when I was working with her, and she now is an advisor in the White House. So there's lots of interesting things you can do with a degree um, that has something to do with the ocean. So she's like a science advisor in the White House and gets to play with the president's dogs and things. Um, so there's lots of interesting things you can do. Now, I don't want to leave you on a doom and gloom note with the, with the coral bleaching aspect. Uh, there are some good things happening. For example, this is where reefs exist right now in the Florida Keys. They haven't been up here for a while, hundreds of years. But right here where this star is, there's a thicket of this Acropora cervus cornus coral. So some of these corals are able to basically migrate north where it's a little bit cooler. Now, not all the corals will be able to do that, but there is some hope that some of them will be able to do that and escape some of these really warm temperatures. We're even growing some of them. So um, this is relatively fast growing, a proper cervicornis. Uh, this is staghorn coral. So we grow them, and then when they get big, we can put them back out on the reef. Typically, we do this um, in response to boats that are hitting reefs and damaging the reef, um, but there's also some people who are working on this in terms of helping them move north as well. Coming back to the greenhouse effect. I mentioned that one of the drivers of that is carbon dioxide. Having carbon dioxide increase the temperature of the world is only one impact, one effect. There's another effect that's happening with this as well. So going back to chemistry very, very quickly, uh, this is our pH scale, right? Things up here, high numbers, are more basic, and things down here are more acidic, like your stomach acid, right? So more basic, more acidic. And when we talk about that, we're really talking about Fewer hydrogens floating around up here and more hydrogens available down here. There is something going on in our oceans called acidification. Ocean acidification. And I'm actually, in some ways, more concerned about ocean acidification than I am the bleaching. So let's talk about what we mean by acidification, and we'll use a, a, a temperature analogy here. If I tell you that we went from 100 degrees Fahrenheit to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, I think you would agree with me that things got colder, right? Is 80 degrees Fahrenheit cold? No. Acidification. If we go from 8.2 to 8.1, we got more acidic. Is 8.1 acidic? No. Just like 80 degrees Fahrenheit is not cold, right? But we're more acidic than we were. And that's what's happening in our oceans. So if we zoom in on that part of the scale where 7 is neutral, Pre-industrial revolution, so, you know, 1700s-ish, that the oceans was 8.2. Today it's 8.1. And it's projected to go as low as 7.8 to 7.9 by 2100. You're like, ah, that's only 0.4. That's not very big. Well, it's a logarithmic scale. So if we drop pH by 0.1, that means the amount of hydrogen ions we have floating around increases by 26%. So if we drop by 0.4, that's a 100% increase. 
that's two times as many hydrogen ions floating around. That's a big impact on these organisms that are living in this, this acidifying ocean. So you can actually see this. So this is showing us uh, how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. You can see that there's a parallel rise in the amount of carbon dioxide in the oceans and notice how pH is going down. So we have really good data with people monitoring this to show us what's happening. What does this mean? So why does this matter? Carbon dioxide, when it gets in the ocean, two things happen. Carbonic acid forms, so that lowers our pH, right, becomes more acidic. But the other thing is, when that carbonic acid form, that means there's less carbonate available for the corals to use or anything that makes hard parts. They make their skeletons out of calcium carbonate. If that carbonate is busy being part of carbonic acid, it means it's not available to build your hard parts. So the double whammy here is that not only is there not enough material around for you to build your hard parts, but if you do build your hard parts, things are more acidic and so your hard parts are more likely to get eaten away by the water. Okay? What does this mean for us? Well, uh, NOAA has a whole ocean acidification program. That's how important it is of people monitoring this. And I want to introduce you to this little guy right here. This is a pteropod, and I love them. So it looks like a snail, right? So you see, like, it has a little snail shell. And I think you guys are probably used to snails that have the shell on their back, and then they're kind of oozing along, right? These guys, that foot that most snails kind of ooze around on, has evolved into wings. So these are sea butterflies. And they actually move these wings and basically fly around in the water column. They are fundamentally important to many ecosystems. They form the base of some food chains, and they're beautiful. So here is an example of uh, a beautiful pteropod. See, its shell is all nice and pretty. Right? Here is one that's been exposed to water that has a higher CO2 content. So we have more carbonic acid here. And here is one that's been exposed to relatively high levels. Notice how the shell is all degraded. It's not looking so good. Um, notice that the foot doesn't look as good. These guys can't swim as well. Um, so, I mean, it hurts my heart just because I think they're like the coolest organisms. But this has major implications because if they're forming the base of a food chain and bad things happen to them, that means that that's going to cascade up through the whole, um, the whole system and affect other organisms. And I don't want you to think this, this is just something that's hurting an organism that happens to be one of my favorites. It also has really big economic consequences. So, for example, uh, on the Pacific Northwest in Oregon, they do a lot of oyster farming. And so here is, well, here are two one-day-old Pacific oyster larvae. They're starting to make their hard parts. This scale bar is 0.1 millimeters. It's about the width of a human hair. Notice that this one, it looks pretty good. It's nice and symmetric. It seems to be doing well. But this one that's the same age, it was born from the same parents, it was exposed to water that had a higher CO2 content. Notice that it's not as big and it's got these weird things happening in the shell. The reason this is a problem is because these guys cannot feed themselves until their hard parts are fully formed. So it's a race against time for them to get their hard parts formed and get themselves feeding themselves. If it's taking longer or there are any issues, they're gonna run out of energy before they're even able to feed themselves. So that's gonna have huge economic consequences for people who are oyster farmers, right? And it may also, I mean, ultimately one day, maybe if you really like to eat oysters, that may impact you. Now, good news is that a lot of the issues that we're having are a result, ultimately, of the Industrial Revolution and the amount of fossil fuels we burn. Fortunately, solar and wind power are becoming less and less expensive and are predicted, the prices for them, the costs for them are predicted to come down more and more in the future, so hopefully we can switch over. If you're interested in doing something about this, right, there are lots of things you can do, walk or take a bike instead of driving your car, right? But you can also get involved. So like, for example, on Long Island, there's a citizens campaign for the environment that does a lot of stuff locally for the environment. There's also uh, an environmental voters forum. So it turns out they'll do the hard work for us to look at different candidates and see how environmentally friendly those candidates are. And then you can use that to help you make decisions when you're voting, if you choose. Nationally, we have a lot of protected areas. So the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. So I did a fair amount of work there and you have to work really hard to get permits to be able to, to do the work I, that I used to do there. 
Um, we also have, I'm not going to try uh, to pronounce it, um, the national monument that's underwater in Hawaii that Obama recently expanded to uh, take in much larger area and protect that many more organisms. There are things going on internationally. You guys may have heard of the Kyoto Protocols from back in the day, and there have been other climate meetings. Climate change is so big, it's going to take international efforts and international cooperation to combat. So what can you do? Well, you can do things like in your life, if you like to eat fish, choose sustainable seafood, right? So there are different websites you can go to, and we can talk afterwards about um, where you can go that give you little cheat sheets about what's good and what's not. Conserve water. If you do go diving, or my fellow divers and snorkelers, don't touch anything. Uh, those corals are animals, and if we touch them, we can actually damage them, okay? Um, don't give corals as gifts. Uh, sometimes when I go to places to work, um, the shops will have corals for sale. Don't buy those, right? We don't want people out harvesting corals. They take a long time to grow. Um, for you guys, um, not putting chemicals into our waterways, right? So sometimes when you put things down the drain, particularly like storm drains, you don't want chemicals going down there because ultimately they end up on our reefs. The biggest thing you can do is go vote, right? So we have a big election coming up. I'm sure none of you have heard of it, um, but it's coming up. So uh, just make sure you go out and vote. Like that's one of the big ways that we can have a big impact on climate change because it is an international issue, okay? So with that, I will uh, say thank you. Thanks for listening to my anecdotes and I'll take questions. So I'm told that if you would like to ask a question, there are microphones available. I'm very friendly, so I know you must have some questions. Oh, I see a hand. Yeah, I want to know, like, what percentage of coral moves north? Oh, that's a good question. The question is, what percentage of coral moves north? We don't know yet. Um, it's too soon to tell. Uh, some of the corals, we don't even completely understand their reproductive cycles. Like sea fan corals, we don't actually know when they reproduce even though we've been studying them very closely. Uh, many of the corals, it's amazing, do um, broadcast spawning, where essentially they release their, their eggs and sperm up into the water column, uh, usually on a cycle with the moon, so that they're all, the same species is all doing it at the same time. It's very magical. The eggs and sperm find each other in the water column, form a little tiny larva that can swim around a bit, but is in most cases at the whim of the current. So it in part depends on where the currents are, um, it depends on if the areas northward have the appropriate bottom, like if it's all sandy, that's not going to work, right? So there's so many things that are involved um, that there's a handful that we know like seem to be moving up a little bit, but I mean the honest answer is we don't really know what's going to happen. I was going to ask you, um, do you plan on continuing with this research on coral one day going back to the reefs and actually um, expanding your research? So Anthony has a great question, like do I plan on going back and doing the coral research? I will tell you I am so done with scuba diving. I did like, I know, right? But listen, I did like 400 dives in eight years. I'm kind of done. Uh, um, so for me, um, you know, Bob had alluded to it. When I was doing my postdoc at Scripps, I, I wrote a big grant, got it funded, and, and I wrote into my job description I would spend 10% of my time doing public education and outreach. And I loved that part of my job so much that I decided to focus on that, right? That that's what I would do with my career. Because I have amazing colleagues who are traveling to all these places and doing all that work, and then I get to talk about it. Um, so I love the diving. I mean, I had a great time. I find it so interesting. And so timely, given that right now, at this very moment, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of corals that are bleaching right now. This is such a timely event. But for me, my passion really was talking to people, getting the word out to people. I've been involved with three different international um, climate change communication events and workshops for um, postdocs and early career faculty to help train them how to talk to the public. So for me, I've got such a great group of people that's, that are doing the research that I feel like we need more of us in the sphere of talking to the public. So no, I probably won't go back, although, I mean, if they twisted my arm, yeah, I'd go back to Palau or something and go diving. But, you know, you, you can't say no when someone offers you something like for free, right? Great question, thanks. Yeah, do you want them to come get mics? Yeah, can you guys come down to mics? Sorry.
so about how many species of coral are there? Ooh, great question. And how do um, we quantify when they go extinct? Oh, and how do you quantify when they go extinct? So how many species of coral are there and how do you quantify when they go extinct? Boy. Well, we've got at least 600 species uh, on the um, Great Barrier Reef. Um, then we've got uh, a bunch more species in the Caribbean. So I would say on the order of 700-ish that you may consider to be reef building and on reefs, but, there's a but, there are many more than that that don't form reefs. Um, there are black corals, there are soft corals, there are corals that live many hundreds of feet below the water. So for that one, I'd have to look up the official number for you of all those types of corals, but we're talking about hundreds of different species. Now, in terms of when one goes extinct, I mean, you'd have to make sure it didn't exist anymore. I'm trying to think off the top of my head if I can think of one that's gone extinct. Uh, at least in the Caribbean, I can't think of an extinction, but what has happened is we've had major shifts in the dominant coral that's present. So that one that I was showing you at the end that we put back out on the reefs and is all like fingery, the, the staghorn coral, um, that used to dominate on reefs. But mm, several years, well, tens of years ago, 20, 30 years ago, there was a disease that came through and essentially wiped it out. And it turns out another type of coral basically took over the reef. So instead of this big branching thing, you had like these little like lettuce heads instead, which completely changes the reef dynamic. So sometimes a coral may not go extinct, but it becomes so rare in a certain area that it completely changes the reef dynamic. So to really know if it went extinct, we just have to watch and make sure it wasn't around anymore. Really. Okay. And that has happened with a seagrass. We've had a seagrass that was wiped out by disease, and we know that it does not exist anymore on Earth. Right? Okay. And then personal question. Yeah. Um, favorite place to scuba dive, deepest place you've dived, um, or deepest depth you've gone, and what level of certification you have for patent? Yeah, so uh, uh, 104 feet was the deepest. Wow. Um, it was not fun. That's a whole nother long, crazy story. Um, most of my dives were between like 15 and 30 feet because the, the corals I was working on were relatively shallow. Um, I was an advanced, so I can't remember what all the special things were, but I also was the safety officer. So that meant that when uh, I was a graduate student and I was working with, you know, tenured, important, full faculty, and they did something wrong, I had to punish them. That's a little awkward. That's kind of an awkward power dynamic. I'll tell you, one of the best dives I've ever done was in Palau. We went down um, and there was a wall. So it was like you come down underwater and you hit the bottom and then you go and then it drops really far off. So there was this ripping current coming up and over the wall. So we actually had hooks, like ropes that were around us with a hook on it. And you would hook yourself onto the bottom and then let go and you were basically like flying in the current. And there were about 80 sharks swimming nice. around. And it was awesome. Night dives? Uh, not that many night dives, only a handful of night dives because most of my work had to be done during the day. Yeah, and you can only dive so much when you're diving for work. Yeah. They're very regimented about how long you can dive, how long you can be under, you can't drink any alcohol. Um, like there's all these things because like I had colleagues that got bent. Uh, and you don't, you don't want to get bent, particularly in Mexico, which is where it happened. You don't want that. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. So I, I have a couple kind of researchy questions. Yeah. to warmer temperatures? That's a great question. And, and let me, I'll ask the other yeah, one, okay. you can, you can do them both. Um, the other question is, does anybody have clues why they're showing that they can double warm temperatures? Okay, so great question, and they're kind of intertwined. Um, so yes, lots of people are working hard to figure out what exactly is going on there with the symbiosis and the breakdown of the symbiosis. We don't exactly know. Um, we think it has something to do with the coral, animal, and the algae being stressed, and then you know, the, those biochemical relationships breaking down. But that's like the fuzziest answer I can give, right? Like we don't really know what's going on. In terms of the adapting, that's really interesting. So it turns out that there are different clades or groups of this algae, the zooxanthellae. Some seem to be more tolerant of warm temperatures and some less so. So the idea is that perhaps if I'm a coral and I'm in nice cool water and I'm really happy and then things get hot, I could kick my current algae out 
and grab some other algae that are more tolerant of temperature, and then I would be fine, right? So that's one of the ideas, is that coral bleaching may be an adaptation mechanism. Um, now, in terms of some species being more tolerant than others, there are some species that seem to be more tolerant. Um, one of the issues, however, though, is that even if they're more tolerant, they're still getting stressed and then potentially getting sick and dying. Um, and the corals grow so slowly anyways that when they're stressed like that, they're not able to put as much energy into growth. And then you end up with issues of, you know, the reef is constantly being degraded, so it's also trying to constantly build up. If the degradation rate stays the same, but you're not building as much, you're going to run into problems there as well. Um, but again, great opportunities for PhD work. Um, whole careers could be spent trying to figure out that relationship between the coral host and the, and the symbiont. Come on down. Go ahead while she's coming down. So you mentioned that like in the Great Barrier Reef, there was like hundreds or like 600 something reefs. What defines an individual reef? Oh, that's a great question. It depends on who you ask. So the question is like what, what defines an individual reef? It depends on who you ask. Um, yeah. Um, so some people might use um, some distance apart from each other. Um, you know, when we were talking about different reefs, when I was working in Mexico, I mean really it was all part of one reef system but you accessed the reef from a different place, um, or there was some boundary, like a big gap in, this, in, in the bottom where it was all sandy, so it, it, it depends. Um, but typically, reef generally means that you have a whole bunch of these organisms that are growing in one area. So it's not like you've got one coral over there, and then, you know, 100 feet away you have one other coral. People might not consider that to be a reef, but when you have lots of the corals and lots of these organisms all growing together, you would consider that a reef. The extent of that reef, the size of the reef, would depend on your specific definition. Uh, I had a question about the relationship between the algae and uh, the coral. I know the coral have a uh, get like food from the algae, but what benefit do the algae have for being in the coral? Oh, that's coral? a great question. So the algae get a nice place to live, right? It's safe. No one's going to come around and eat them when they're inside of the coral host. And they're probably also receiving some of the waste from the coral. So some of these areas can be nitrogen limited, and so the coral, uh, as part of its metabolic processes, is producing nitrogen. And it could be providing that, it could be providing um, CO2 from some of its uh, cellular respiration processes to the, to the algae as well. So the algae is likely getting some nutrients, right, that it needs, while at the same time giving nutrients to the coral. The algae is also getting a nice happy place to live. I have one other question. Um, so is it possible that the reason for why they're being expelled in the change in temperature could have something to do with like maybe causing a change in a waste production for the coral? Absolutely. It could be all kinds of things. There could be, I'm not a biochemist, um, but there, there could be uh, some chemical reactions that are happening or not happening um, or a buildup of something that makes it uncomfortable, say, for the algae. Um, it could also be that the coral literally is, is doing something to, to get rid of the algae, but clearly something is breaking down, something about that very tight relationship. If you can imagine something living inside of your cells, that's going to be a pretty close relationship, and it's going to need some balance there, and that balance is being affected, and so then they're leaving. So do we know clearly about how the algae actually, like, get in there in the first place? Because you meant, like, uh, because I'm, I'm not sure, but I think when they're born, the algae's probably not there. Right, so the algae can be picked up from the environment, and you ask a really great question. Gosh, I feel like I'm back in my, uh, my oral defense, right? Um, it's been a long time. I never studied the part where the algae actually gets into the coral and that mechanism, but we should talk afterwards, and I will relearn it. We can look it up together. Okay. okay? Oh, I've got one more question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take Sorry. a round of applause. That was okay. <laughs> I have two questions, yeah, I guess, before we end it for the, yeah. for the uh, evening. Uh, first of all, ocean acidification, as you probably know, commercial shelf fish, fishers, folks have been suing the EPA for not regulating greenhouse gases, mm -hmm. and the EPA is struggling with h how to regulate whatever they need to regulate for ocean acidification. So 
how would you rec what w re advice would you give to the folks in the White House Science Office about how to deal with these uh, very local problems with commercial disruption as a result of ocean acidification? That's one. And secondly, sorry, that's a hard one. <laughs> secondly, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how students can work with you and a little bit about your program and the kinds of things that you teach here? Yeah, super. Uh, so first, uh, your first question, uh, I would turn to my, my colleague, Dr. Pettish in the White House and ask her what she thinks. Uh, I mean, that's a really tricky problem, right? So this is an international issue. We're all releasing this carbon dioxide and what, do we, what could we do for our, our local businesses, economies, right, that are doing this? I don't have, I don't know that there is an easy answer. I, I, like, I, I'm stuck, I don't, I don't know. Um, it's a great question. Um, second, what I do here, um, I teach primarily uh, in the intro series in biology. Um, I like that because I'm passionate about exciting people about science. Um, and I've also taught our non-majors, which I really enjoy. Uh, my research specifically is on metacognition, which is thinking about thinking. Uh, and helping students become aware of their thought processes, helping them become more efficient, more effective learners. Uh, and so right now I'm working on a big project trying to figure out how do we quantify someone's metacognitive development and how do we shift them along a continuum of metacognitive development from not being aware of their thinking to being very aware of their thinking and being very efficient, effective learners. So if anyone wants to work with me, just let me know. Uh, if you want to do core reef stuff, you can also let me know because I have colleagues that are always looking for excellent students, whether you're undergrads who are going to go uh, and work with them in the Philippines for a summer or if you're looking for master's or PhD programs, um, they are always looking for great students and our students at Hofstra, I have found, are really amazing. So I would have no qualms about sending any of you to um, have some great experiences with them. One more? Yeah, so yeah. Okay. Uh, well, because you mentioned the Kyoto Protocol, which is something I was mm -hmm. going to ask about, which the U.S. has yet to um, has yet to sign, and you're looking at climate change. As much as this election has been going on forever, it's been rarely spoken sure. about. None of the elections or anything like that. You look at uh, you know it's happening around the world. The Maldives, the sea level has been rising there, yeah. and it'll be underwater in no time probably, which is sad. But what is something that can be done in terms of immediate fashion, in terms of climate change and global warming, because it's not spoken about, very few people know about it, depending on the kind of schools you go to, um, they're probably not teaching it or they're telling you it doesn't exist, because it, depending on where you grow up and what kind of schools you have. So what immediate action can be taken and how do you bring that to, I guess, the younger generation? Because the likelihood of them talking about it or learning about it really is slim to none. Yeah, oh my gosh, that's such a great question and I, I wish I had all the answers. You're right, I think it was like six minutes of all the debates was actually on climate change, it's some infinitesimally small amount. Um, part of it is voting, um, and even if it's not talked about in national elections, so some of those down ballot things, um, if there are candidates that are talking about it, you can put it out that way. There are those local organizations that I mentioned specifically for Long Island, that's probably one of the best ways is to get involved with a group of people. Our voices tend to be louder and be amplified when we have a group of people that are working in a concerted effort. Uh, in terms of reaching students, um, that's a great question. Um, there are several ways that that can be done. Um, there are ways that we can infuse more climate change into the courses, like for example here at Hofstra. Um, I know they were trying to put a cluster together that was sort of focused around climate change. We're talking in biology about introducing some more like thematic things into our courses that would revolve around those. Um, part of it is, finding opportunities to make your voice heard. So for example, um, say you are a student and you are interested in secondary education, right? Talk to your faculty here, talk to the professors and say, look, this is something I'm actually really interested in. Is there a way that this could be incorporated into lessons that I personally teach? Uh, but there are also organizations like NOAA um, and, and many other organizations already have sort of modules that are prepared. So for us personally, it's about deciding what we personally wanna do and invest our time in. Right? whether that's politically or in terms of educating people. Um, and then in a larger scale, it's about making sure that we keep this on the forefront. I mean, people could go so far as writing editorials for the paper, right? If you want to reach a lot of people, there's a lot of different mechanisms and it really just depends on the person about what you want to do to get that out there. Yeah, I wish I had all the answers. I wish I had like, I could pull up the perfect answer for you that would solve all the problems. 
That's a great way to close off, good question to close off this evening's uh, discussion. Please join me in thanking Dr. St. Angelo for her talk. Left, left, left. I'm living for the